Kennedy said, well, we're going to put an American on the moon in 10 years' time. Earth and planetary science at Caltech was an absolute total upheaval over this. We didn't know anything about interplanetary space. We knew nothing. And that's when I got involved in all this early work on plate tectonics. It was a hell of exciting time. Welcome to Polar Podcasts, where you'll hear stories from geologists who've spent their careers, their lives, exploring and studying the remarkable and remote geology of Greenland. Why did they become fascinated with Greenland? What were the problems and the discoveries that drove them? And what was it like working in these remote places where few people venture, even now? I'm Julie Holtz. In this episode, we hear more from Brian Upton, Emeritus Professor at the University of Edinburgh, about his early years as a researcher when the theory of plate tectonics was being developed, his time at Caltech, La Reunion, and his experiences on returning to Greenland, investigating plate tectonic links between northwest Greenland and Arctic Canada. About 1960, 61, 62, when the words plate and tectonics were only just beginning to be married together. People were finding funny things. They'd been working on deep ocean trenches. One of the Japanese found that as you chase these away from the trenches, the earthquakes got deeper and deeper and deeper. And, oh, oh, rocks away from the trenches get more potassic. Ah, Maddie Thorpe and Bruce Heason made the first adequate map of the mid Atlantic Ridge. Other people were looking at uh, magnetic anomalies in East Iceland lavas. Other people from Cambridge Geophysics were pulling magnetometers behind them across the Atlantic and finding the magnetic structure. It was at that stage in the early 1960s, Harry Hess was interested in greenstone belts in the Appalachians. Greenstone belts are metamorphosed volcanic rocks, often occurring together with sedimentary rocks. They are called greenstone belts because the metamorphic minerals in these rocks often give them a greenish colour. Ophiolites. Good gracious, perhaps these are part of the story too. Perhaps these are bits of ancient ocean floor. Ophiolites are indeed bits of ocean floor that have been pushed up onto the top of continental crust during plate tectonic movements at plate margins. All of these observations were hinting at a new model for how the Earth works that was finally resolved into the modern theory of plate tectonics, the understanding that the Earth's crust is divided into discrete plates that move slowly over the Earth's surface, driven by gravity and by convection in the underlying mantle with new crust forming in the deep ocean at mid-ocean ridges and being destroyed at ocean margins where the oceanic crust is subducted beneath the continents, returning to the mantle beneath. So by 1964-65, that was my early years here. At the University of Edinburgh. Plate tectonics was universally accepted by everybody except the Soviet Union and its satellites. But it was a hell of exciting time. Harry Hess pointed out to me that, or one of his students did, that we knew nothing about oceanic islands apart from a bit about Iceland and a bit about Hawaii. But there were hundreds of the damn things. Harry Hess had spent his war hunting Japanese submarines in the Pacific, but really just left his echo sounder on the entire time and found these thousands. Pacific Ocean at that time, you know, it was deep water. I don't know what's down there. There's mud at the bottom somewhere, a hell of a long way down. He found all these flat top mountains all in place. It was all new. Oceanic islands must have started a bit like this. And I thought, well, I'd like to work on an oceanic island. And I spent a long time looking at it and um, started reading what the French had done about the island of La Réunion in the Indian Ocean. God damn it, there seems to be just about a twin for the Hawaiian volcanoes. It's got two enormous volcanoes. One is active and relatively boring. He's referring to the Hawaiian volcanic islands. The other one is deeply dissected and gives you everything from latest constructional surfaces, down through the lavas, down through the hyperbyssal complexes, down into layered intrusions, nearly two and a half kilometres down into its guts. Brian is explaining here that because of uplift and erosion, the rocks at the surface of La Reunion show the whole cross-section through the structure of the volcano through to the deepest parts of the magma systems that would normally be deep beneath the earth. 
working on La Reunion, working on the Gardo complex, I kept thinking, oh, that relates to this, this relates to that. And it was working on stuff that one can see at the surface, and deep dissections are what I'm looking at here. That took me to 1960 when I left GGU. GGU stands for the Geological Survey of Greenland. I went to Caltech, and that's when I got involved with all this early work on plate tectonics. It was hugely fun because I got there virtually the same week that um, President Kennedy was um, made president, and uh, Sputnik was up there, annoying the hell out of the Americans, and uh, Kennedy said, well, we're going to beat them, well, we're going to put an American on the moon in 10 years' time. Nobody said possible, but anyway, he really was like putting his foot into a termite nest and Earth and science and planetary science at Caltech was an absolute total upheaval over this. What the hell do we know about the moon? Somebody said, oh, Yuri said, oh, it's completely covered with, probably covered with diamonds because of all these high pressure impacts all the time on it. And other people said, no, you couldn't even put a lander down there because it's all soft stuff. We're just going to lose it. People were reading anything they could. It's not very, very long ago. We didn't know anything about the atmosphere or about interplanetary space. We knew nothing. Anyway, I was out of a visa. I was married with a very small child. We were bust and visaless, and I was trying for a job anywhere on Earth. And again, my good fairy um, descended, and the end, I got a letter from Fred Stewart here. At the University of Edinburgh. Saying, Brown, Michael Harris is going to be at the Geophysical Lab for 12 months if you want to try and control his students and hold his chair down for years. It's yours. So I went down the corridor to get the coffee and my work instructions were that I had to have the coffee for the staff ready at 11 o'clock every morning and I had to have tea ready at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. (laughs) At this stage, Brian got involved in studying the plate tectonic links between Greenland and Arctic Canada. Across the Pacific there were these enormous fault escarpments. What the hell were they? And it was Professor Tuse Wilson in Toronto that said, these things join up with the mid-Atlantic, with the mid-ocean ridges on the other end to trenches and do the intermediate. And they're the third stick in the plate tectonic puzzle. We're going to, I'm going to call them transform faults. Anyway, he had a student. Barry Clark came to Edinburgh as a PhD student and uh, he said, I know there are some basalts on the east coast of Battenland why don't you go and look at those and see if there are anything like those that have been described by Harold Reaver and go on the west coast of Greenland. And I flew over to Canada to join him and we flew out, a series of flights, uh, getting to the US Air Force to um, one of the Dewline bases which had been set up around the Arctic to detect incoming, possible incoming Soviet missiles. Dew Line stands for Distant Early Warning Line. These were a series of American radar stations which stretched from Alaska through Arctic Canada, Greenland, the Faroe Islands and Iceland during the Cold War to provide an early warning of an attack. And from there we uh, went on a boat, an open whale boat with an Inuit, Paulusi, and his 13-year-old son uh, sailing southwards down the coast in and out the fields, in collecting through each of the principal outcrops of the Baffinland um, picrites. Picrites are a type of basalt that form by large amounts of melting of the mantle, the largest layered part of the earth that lies beneath the earth's crust. Definitely the coldest season I've ever spent anywhere. All the time in an open whale boat trying to pick your way between uh, ice flows, trying to find breaks. Paulusia learned such English as he had from the Americans. Blue West One, one of the June Line bases, showed not very good English. I can remember landing once with him to see if we could see any way through the ice, and we climbed up on top of the cliff and he pulls out a telescope. Well, Paulusi, do we see any way out? And he just looks now as in ice, no fucking good. <laughs> We had quite a lot of trouble with pack ice. It was often difficult finding routes, clear water routes, uh, through them. 
And on one occasion, the ice had closed in and or was closing in, and we also found that we were taking on water, at least as fast as we could bail it. We were taking water in through the um, drive shaft. Paulusi saw a whale back island, an island made of gnices, and we headed for it. And five of us on board the whale boat hauled the boat up as high as we could, which was not very high. The tides were strong, the ice was moving fast, and we would certainly have been overrun by pack ice on the smooth island shore if we hadn't got it up above ice level. So we had a problem in what to do about the boat. Uh, Paulusi um, walked up and down the beach for some time, smoking cigarettes, until he found a suitable crevice in the nices, and he squatted down with a wobbly hammer and a cold chisel about eight inches or so long, and he started drilling out a hole in the nice, using the crack as the uh, basis for the, uh, the operation. And when he had made a hole deep enough to accommodate at least six inches of the chisel, with the chisel angled so that it was dipping back downwards towards the sea. He tried this with his hands and decided that the chisel was in sufficiently firmly for his purpose. He went back to the boat and found uh, his block and tackle under the floorboards. And we got the block and tackle hitched up to the uh, chisel that had been hammered in and were able to haul the boat high and dry up onto the ice. We still had the problem of how to fix the leak. We uh, had a look at the situation and there was a leather gasket around the drive shaft which was uh, really pretty broken and uh, Paul Lucy was rather dismayed by the situation and I offered a solution. I took one of my boots off and cut the leather toe out of it which cheered up Paul Lucy very considerably. We made a hole in this and made our new improvised gasket for the uh, drive shaft. But we had to spend some days on the island waiting for ice to clear before we could um, make further progress. I'm Julie Hollis, and you've been listening to Polar Podcasts. In the next episode, we hear more from Emeritus Professor Kent Brooks about the Scareguard intrusion, which became the focus of his long career in East Greenland.